Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this podcast of ERA's 30 Years, 30 Cases series. My name is Daniel Gärtner, and I'm senior lawyer at the Academy of European Law in Trier, ERA. This year, 2022, ERA is celebrating its 30th anniversary. To mark this anniversary, ERA will be launching a series of video podcasts entitled 30 Years, 30 Cases throughout the whole year. Each of the videos will deal with one specific year from 1992 to 2022 and a landmark case of the Court of Justice of the European Union. In the now following video, we will present a landmark case from 1993, case 127-92, Dr. Pamela Mary Enderby versus French Health Authority and Secretary of State for Health, the so-called Enderby case, which deals with equal pay. Equal pay for equal work is one of the EU's founding principles enshrined in Article 157 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. It was introduced by the Treaty of Rome, then as Article 119, back in 1957. And although it was introduced for reasons relating to the functioning among businesses across the common market, rather than a dire concern for gender equality in the workplace, it made it possible for the whole body of EU gender equality law to develop from this point onwards, and it marks the starting point of a story of success of European social policy. The Enderby case of 1993 was brought to the European Court of Justice in the framework of a preliminary reference procedure pursuant to what was then Article 177 of the EEC Treaty, by the Court of Appeal of England and Wales. The ECJ was asked three different questions concerning the interpretation of Article 119 of the EEC Treaty relating to a difference in pay between two jobs of presumably equal value, of which one is carried out almost exclusively by women and the other predominantly by men. I'm now delighted to introduce the speaker who will present to you the factual background of the case, as well as the main legal questions and answers of the judgment, and also explain to you why this case was, and still is, considered such an important case in the era of equal pay for men and women. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Catherine Bernard. Catherine Bernard is Professor of EU Law and Employment Law and Senior Tutor and Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. She is the author of numerous publications on EU law and employment law, and she is a member of the European Commission funded European Labour Law Network. She is also a senior fellow and deputy director of the UK in a Changing Europe project. She has appeared in the UK's main media channels, written for The Guardian and The Telegraph, and she has given evidence to numerous select committees on the legal issues connected with Brexit, immigration, and the European Union Withdrawal Act. I would like to sincerely thank Professor Bernard for having accepted the invitation to contribute to ERA's 30 Years, 30 Cases project by presenting the Enderby case. Hello, I'm going to talk about a really important case on equal pay for men and women, a case that was referred from the uh, UK courts, a case called Enderby. Now, just in summary, what happened in Enderby was that she was a speech therapist and the profession of speech therapy was predominated by women and they were paid significantly less than jobs done by men, predominantly men, not exclusively men, namely clinical psychologists who were paid about £12,500 per year and pharmacists who were paid about £14,000. Now, she said that she was wanted to be paid the same as these jobs done predominantly by men and with the support of her union and the equal opportunities commission which is in the past has been a very important body for uh, supporting cases going to uh, the court of justice she first started a case in the local court she went to the employment tribunal and then the employment appeal tribunal and at those two levels, uh, both concluded that there was no discrimination 
And there was no discrimination because the fact that the pay for speech therapists and the pay for pharmacists and clinical psychologists had been set by collective agreements. Case was appealed again to the Court of Appeal and it decided to make a reference to the European Court of Justice under Article 267 to ask how does what was then Article 119, now Article 157 on equal pay, deal with this sort of case. Now, crucially, the Court of Appeal said this case is uh, will proceed on the basis that it's about work of equal value. It's clearly not like work because the work of speech therapists, the work of clinical psychologists clearly is not the same, but their work was deemed for the purposes of this case to be of equal value. And the UK courts asked three questions, and that's exactly how the Court of Justice responded. So the first question was essentially, is this a case about discrimination? Now, actually, the British court didn't ask the question in quite that form. But essentially, if you look at the court's answer to the question, the court seemed to suggest that there was discrimination in this case. Now, as you know, and as you can see from the diagram on the right hand side of the screen, there are two types of discrimination, direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination is less favorable treatment on the grounds of sex. So that would be the case if we were dealing with, for example, two speech therapists and the man was paid more than the woman. But this case was more complicated. It's one of the reasons why this case is so important, because this case was about the fact that there was one group, speech therapists, who were being who were predominantly women and being paid less, and another group, uh, clinical psychologists, pharmacists, predominantly men, who were paid more. And so here the court said, and you can see the two key paragraphs on your slide, that it's the if the pay of speech therapists is significantly lower than that of pharmacists, and if the former speech therapists um, are almost exclusively women, while the latter the pharmacists are predominantly men, there is a prima facie case of sex discrimination, at least where the jobs are of equal value. And you'll remember that's what the Court of Appeals said. So a good indication that this case was about not direct discrimination, but about indirect discrimination. Now, then the court went on to say, well, it's up to the National Court, the Court of Appeal, uh, to assess whether it may take into account those statistics, that's to say whether um, they cover enough individuals, whether they illustrate purely fortuitous or short-term phenomena, and whether in general they appear to be significant. So the Court, of, uh, the Court of Justice takes the matter back to the British Court of Appeal to say, look, just look at the statistics, interrogate the statistics closely and see if you find indirect discrimination. Now, just as a note, this case was decided under Article 157 on equal pay. It's a treaty provision. If you look at the directives now, you don't uh, have to produce statistics in order to show indirect discrimination. It's enough that you can show particular disadvantage. But here, the court emphasized very much the statistics. Now, the court said, if there is discrimination, and it's going to be indirect discrimination here, then the burden shifts to the employer in this case, the National Health Service, to defend the difference in treatment. And that's known as objective justification. And you can see that on the right-hand side of the slide. One footnote, what's still rather unclear when you're looking at the treaty is if you're dealing with direct discrimination in respect of equal pay, is there a defense at all for direct discrimination? Now, that wasn't an issue uh, in this um, case, but just to flag up that that is a problem. If you're looking at the directives, there is a defence, the occupational requirement defence, but that's not built into the treaty. But nevertheless, what you see here is a variation on the theme. And the theme is that in the past, if part timers have been paid less than full timers, that was found to be indirect discrimination. Here, it was a job done predominantly by women, speech therapy, and that was being paid less than the job done by men. And therefore, the question is, is there objective justification? Which brings me to the second question 
that the National Court asked. Can you objectively justify discrimination on the grounds that there were separate collective bargaining processes? So there was a collective bargaining process for speech therapists and another one for pharmacists and clinical psychologists. Is that enough? Is that your trump card, your get out of jail free card to say that actually um, that explains why speech therapists are being paid less than uh, clinical psychologists and pharmacists? Well, the UK government said yes, that was absolutely the answer to the question. Court of Justice adopts a much more nuanced approach. And as you can see from the slide, the court says the fact that the rates of pay are decided by collective bargaining processes conducted separately for each of the two professional groups without any discriminatory effect. So the court was saying the fact that all speech therapists are paid the same, whether they're men or women, and all um, clinical psychologists are paid the same, whether they're men or women, that is not the relevant issue. It doesn't preclude a finding of discrimination where the results of those processes show that two groups with the same employer, same trade union are treated differently. And the court goes on to make the policy point. If the employer could rely on the absence of discrimination within each of the collective bargaining processes taken separately as sufficient justification, then that could easily circumvent the principle of equal pay because you just say, right, we'll have one collective bargaining process for jobs done predominantly by women and another collective bargaining process for jobs done predominantly by men. And remember as well, there's always been this allegation that there is implicit bias in the collective bargaining process because jobs which are predominantly done by men are seen as proper jobs and therefore should be paid properly, whereas jobs done by uh, predominantly by women traditionally seen as pin money or supplementary income and therefore they could be paid less and this is one of the reasons why you see in the public sector that for example jobs like cleaning uh, uh, school meal assistance jobs done predominantly by women have been significantly less well paid than jobs traditionally done by men like like um, bin collection for example and the court of justice rightly in my view, really tries to interrogate that issue and says you can't just rely on different collective bargaining as an objective justification. Now, the third question was, well, what about market forces? Can we say, well, look, there's a shortage of, um, say, uh, pharmacists, therefore we should pay pharmacists more. It's a bit like in other countries, there is a shortage of maths teachers. Because there's a shortage of maths teachers, the argument goes, you pay maths teachers more in order to attract people to become maths teachers. And that would be a market forces argument. Now, the court does recognize the market forces argument as a justification. And I, um, you can see this from the slide. The state of the employment market, which may lead an employer to increase the pay of a particular job in order to attract candidates, uh, for example, maths teachers, or in this case, uh, clinical psychologists or pharmacists. And that may constitute an objectively justified economic ground within the meaning of the case law. And then, they, then the court goes on to say, it's up to the national court to determine precisely the difference in pay attributable to the market forces. In other words, if the uh, job in which there's a shortage is paid 2,000 pounds, 2,000 euros more, is that the sufficient to reflect uh, the difference in pay due to market forces? What happens if the employer paid 5,000 pounds more, 5,000 euros more? just because ultimately they wanted to support traditionally male jobs. The court says a proportionality principle has got to be applied. So that's what the court said. The question then is, is it a good decision? And what happened next? In the last couple of minutes, I just want to address those issues. Now, as far as what happened next, well, it took a while, but finally um, the NHS, the employer in this case, did settle the case. And what I've got extracted on this slide is a report from the independent newspaper saying what happened next. A couple of things to note, it took 11 years for this case finally to get sorted out and it had been through umpteen levels of the court process. It's all set out 
uh, in the details here, but they finally did get their money. They finally did get their back pay with the potential cost of really quite significant sums to the NHS, which is always a challenge for the public sector employers in these cases. So she wins, um, and indeed this was a test case, so other speech therapists also win, and it also put down an important marker in the NHS that it should watch out for these sorts of jobs where jobs done predominantly by women are paid less well than jobs predominantly done by men. Let's zoom out for a moment and say what has happened to the gender pay gap in that time. Now I've focused on the, I'm gonna focus on the British statistics because obviously this is a British case. And the good news is that the gender pay gap has declined since 1997. If you look at the slide, the top line is for all jobs. And the middle line is for full-time jobs. But just look at the line at the bottom for part-time jobs. What you're seeing is, in fact, it's been really pretty constant. There is a gender pay gap. And what's worse is it the gender pay gap has deteriorated in the last couple of years during lockdown rather than getting better. It's got better for those who are working full time, but not for those working part time and who are predominantly working part time. Yes, you've got it. It's women. Final slide. How has uh, academia responded to this judgment? Well, at one level, of course, it's good news because ultimately end to be one. It took 11 years. And um, she bravely uh, fought this case. And fought is the right word. These cases are highly adversarial and you've got to have a lot of gut to be able to bring these sorts of cases and tenacity and really some important support um, who are from outside people who are funding your case. But has it led to greater systemic change? Why did the government um, fight this case so hard? And I think the answer to that is they knew the cost implications. And remember, all of these public sector cases come with a very significant price tag attached, not just in the individual case, but uh, more broadly. Also, there's been much criticism about the court being allowing for the market um, forces defence. Remember, that was the third issue that was raised before the Court of Justice, because it may perpetuate discrimination. Which jobs do you tend to pay more money to? Well, maths teachers, maths teachers, predominantly men. You pay more money to um, uh, clinical psychologists and pharm pharmacists because they're jobs, they are jobs done predominantly by um, men. And so that serves to reinforce the gender pay gap. Now, some people would say, well, actually, market forces operate. That lots of women want to be speech therapists because that can be done part time. Why can it be done part time? Well, um, of course, women um, have a predominant um, responsibility for child care in a lot of family homes. And that means that they can only work part time. And so this raises a more fundamental structural issue, which the law cannot really tackle, which is how do you make childcare affordable and the joint responsibility of both parents rather than just women? My final point is, of course, a Brexit one. This case was brought um, uh, in uh, 1997. And of course, the UK was still a member state of the EU. And one of the remarkable features about this case and one of the things that lawyers, particularly those working for the EOC, the Equal Opportunities Commission, um, one of those is that they saw the opportunities offered by Article 157 as some sort of constitutional challenge to challenge provisions of UK legislation. Now that has largely been turned off as a result of Brexit and thus has been denied to um, British women wanting to rely on provisions of EU law. But I would say, and maybe because I'm British, I would have to say this, that actually a lot of the key cases from this period came from the UK, Enderby being one, 
funded by the Equal Opportunities Commission, and they have had the effect of changing the face of EU equality law. Thank you very much indeed.